is at the heart of the week, we're in the heart of the message. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that it's time to do what? Do you want to learn how? Now, we were studying up until now the question, why the school of the prophets? Now we're changing the question. Amen? First, why? Now we're studying what? Oh, yes, sister. I love to hear it said. Now that we know why the school of the prophets, why the school of the prophets, because of the corruption that came in, the church lost the ability to understand what needs to be done. But now we know what needs to be done. What needs to be done? The work must be what? Do we know that? Now that we know the work needs to be finished, we need to know first what is the work. And now and then your mind begins to learn because then we're going to understand. Next question, how? Why, what, how? So now we see why the school of the prophets. Now we need to understand what is the work that needs to be finished because we can never finish the work unless we understand clearly what the work is. Do you want to understand it clearly? Yes. By God's grace today, we want to fully understand when we say what is the work. Somebody says, yes, the work needs to be finished. We've been hearing that for, for years, but they say, what is the work? We need to know this clearly, Amen. And this is why God has brought us into existence. Question, who does, is God going to wake up first to teach us what needs to be done? But the, remember, the church is dead. Who, who in the church is he going to wake up first? So the, the common people. Did it happen that way in the first coming? Is it going to happen that way in the second coming? So it's time for us to learn. Is there a way to study in order to do this? Do we need the scholarly approach or the common man approach? Is that going to prepare us for the latter rain? Is it time? I think we need to stop right here and say, Lord, give us this because God is going to wake up the common people. Do you know that this is going on right now? That God is taking the reins, guess what? Into his own hands. Now, the only way that he can use you is if you put your life where? Because when he takes the reins, those are human reins. Divinity must use humanity and they must blend and so God's hand that listen this is the combination of divinity with what the divine hand that Ezekiel talked about that wheel within the wheel the hand that's controlling the work that divine hand that's underneath the cherubims is going to take control of the reins of his church and the reins are the leaders he's going to raise up common leaders to lead this work out what do you say but we must understand what needs to be done, what that work is, so that we can do this. Do you want to understand it? This is the reason why the school of the prophets was raised up, so that we can uh, understand what needs to be done. Let us pray, ask God, Lord, as we go deeper, show us what this work is. Heavenly Father, we're living in the most solemn time of all the ages. You've been in the most holy place now for over 168 years. And Lord, you're longing to come out. And there's only one body that can bring you out. And yet, it feels like nobody wants to get ready. May we, Lord, become one of those bodies, a member of that body, that we can get other members a part of this body so that the work may be finished. Father, we know that humanity cannot do this without divinity. And yet in the plan of redemption, you have so arranged it that, that, that divinity cannot do it without humanity. You want us to have fellowship so that we can co-labor, work together. And thus, in this work, we can know Jesus. You said, take your yoke upon you, Lord. You want us to be a part of this work that we may find rest in Jesus. Father, please, hold back time. Help us to understand. Do something special. Pour out your spirit. Lord, please give us Jesus. We know the devil will stir up everything to prevent Jesus to come in. But, Lord, may we make a decision that nothing is going to prevent us from seeing Jesus. Now, abide with us as we study. Remove every distraction, Lord. May no one come here just to talk, but to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. We take the Bible. And we want to turn to Daniel. What book? Are you ready to study? Daniel chapter 12. You and I know that 
in this great crisis, a time of trouble is getting ready to take place. Now, the world doesn't know anything about the time of trouble. What is the world being told? The political leaders tell us that things are getting ready to get better. What do we tell us that the economy is getting ready to get better? Did we not hear this in this election? The religious leaders are telling us that there's getting ready to be a thousand years of what? Peace. The millennium, that everything is approaching this, that there's going to be a time of peace and prosperity and safety. But Jesus says a storm is coming. So my brothers and sisters, the world thinks that everything is getting ready to get better and they're getting ready to be shaken apart. And there's only one people that have the light that understands this or should understand this. And this is Seventh-day Adventists. Daniel 12 tells us. This is not man's ideas. Daniel 12 tells us we know this. Let's read it together. Verse 1. It says, and at what? That time. We're going to find out when that time is. Shall Michael, Michael is just another name for Jesus. In the Bible, Jesus has been given many names, right? He's been called the mighty counselor, the everlasting God. He's been called the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Jesus, the Lily of the Valley, many names. Michael is another name for Jesus. And it says here that he's going to stand up. In other words, Jesus is going to stand up. The great prince will stand up for the children of thy people. Now, when he stands up, a great crisis is going to take place. We're going to find out a physical crisis and a spiritual crisis. A what? A physical crisis and a spiritual crisis. We're going to deal heavily with a spiritual crisis. The world doesn't know this. And so the Bible says that when he stands up, there's going to be a time of what? Trouble such as never was. Now, in order to go through that time of trouble and be delivered, we must be able to stand with Jesus. When Jesus stands up, God is going to have to prepare people that can stand with him. Are you with me? You know, that's the great issue of Seventh-day Adventism. Listen now. In the last days, the question is asked. You know in Revelation 6, it says, The great day of his wrath is come. And what's the question? Who shall be able to do what? Stand. So before Michael stands up, he must produce a people that can stand. And he can't stand unless his people can stand. God has placed himself with us. What do you say? I mean, think of it. Can we fall into sin and say we're standing? It says he's going to keep us from falling. We read this. We heard this. We found out that the fall of man, when man sinned, we call that the fall of man. So can a man fall into sin and still be standing? So before Michael stands up, a body must be produced that can stand, and you can't sin and stand at the same time. Does that make sense? We'll understand it when we get into the sanctuary. I want us to understand this is the issue. To prepare a people to stand in the investigative judgment, this is the work of seven-day Adventism. This is the work of the plan of redemption. This is the work of Jesus. And I want to work with him. Now, in the Bible, it looked like no one could be able to stand. Now, the other denominations are being taught that you're going to be ready. Even though you're not able to stand, you're still going to be all right, and they don't know this. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Revelation, let's turn to Revelation now, Revelation 12. Because there's only one denomination that knows this, we're told very clearly, brothers and sisters, because there's only one denomination that knows this, that the devil wants to attack this denomination. Look at Revelation. What book did I say? Revelation 12. What is that denomination called? What is it called? It's called Seven-Day Adventists. The remnant, the Bible calls it. And the Bible says in Revelation 12, beginning in verse 17, the Bible says that the devil went to make war with this. Now remember, look at what it says in verse 17. It says, and the dragon was what? Wroth with the woman. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of who? So the dragon or the devil wants to attack the remnant church. Why the remnant? Because that's the only church that has the message that can prepare every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that will be able to stand. Does it make sense? And so the devil says, if I can just destroy them. Now, my brothers and my sisters, is the remnant the whole body? The remnant is the last part of this body, but the remnant have a mission. I want to ask you a question. When God made Adam, was Adam, Adam the whole body of humanity? No, no. When God made man in his own image, he had to create male and guess what? 
female, because remember now, man has to be created in the image of God. God has the ability to, cro uh, to create. Am I right or wrong? Can Adam create by himself? So in order to get man in God's image, man has to have the ability, in a sense, to procreate. So man was not completely into his image until he made male and guess what? Female. You'll find that in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Now, my brothers and my sisters, it takes both male and female to fulfill the image of God. And this is why the devil has created homosexuality. To prevent the image of God from being restored in man, homosexuals can't make a baby. It can't create. And so it denies that there is a creator. It goes with Sunday that is not bringing us back to the creation story. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that when God made man, man was the uh, 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 substance in which he used to create woman. What did God take from man? A rib. And from that rib, what did he do with it? He made a woman out of that rib. No rib, no woman. Because it says she was taken out of man. Whoa, man. So I want to ask you a question. What do you think is the rib of Christ's entire body? Let me say it this way. The remnant church is the rib by which God will make his entire body. The remnant church is the rib whereby God will take his body. Because remember now, there are members of Christ's body in the Catholic church. There are members of that body in the Presbyterian church. There are members of that body that in the church of Satan, some that are not even going to church, there are members that God says, they're still my people, but I must bring them out. And God is going to take the rib in which to make up the entire body. We thought that was Adam and Eve, but he said, no, I show you a mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church, just the way he made it. Now, my brothers and my sisters, listen to me. That means that if the devil can destroy the rib or the remnant, nobody can stand. So this is why the devil says, I must destroy the remnant. I don't have to worry about Babylon. If I can destroy the remnant, nobody can stand. Does it make sense? So the school of the prophets came into existence because the seven Adventist church was raised to do this, but apostasy came in. We studied that, amen? We'll look at it further some other time. But this apostasy came in so that now the message that was to given to us to make us stand has been lost sight of. And every time that came to view, God rose up the school of the prophets to restore us back to what we should be. Now we know why. We know that God is going to use the common people. Now question. Is there a time that this has to take place by? What is the time? You've been hearing it over and over again. What is the time, brother? Said, Talk to me. What's the time? Talk to me. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. What does the class say? When is the time that the rib must be prepared by so that it can get the entire body? What is the time? Praise God. National Sunday Law. We found out that that's it. It says Christ is coming the second time with power into salvation. To prepare human beings for this event, he has sent the first, second, and what? Third angel's message. These angels represent those who receive the truth. So these angels are a representation of those who take this message on. Does it make sense? It says, these angels represent those who receive the truth and will power, open the gospel to the world. Where are these angels found in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? Is that in the Bible? Where are they found in the Bible? Revelation 14. What else? 6 through 12. Now, do you know right now what our problem is, why we've wondered for so long? Anybody know what that is right there? That's a chicken with what? Now, if anybody's in the country, you know in Georgia, you're not too far from the country. Amen. Has anybody ever seen a chicken with his head cut off? Let me, let me see your hands if you ever saw it. Tell me something. What does a chicken do when he gets his head cut off? It runs around in circles. Our denomination has been running around, guess what? In circles, Babylon has been running around in circles, and the only way to stop this head from running in circles is to bring back its head. Follow me now. Because we have to find out when did the head get taken away. Right now, we are confused in evangelism in our church. We're using confusing Babylonian methods because our head has been severed. We're using wrong methods in our schools because our head has been severed. Somebody says we've lost our mind. Yes, we have. We've lost our head. When a man loses his head, he acts insane. It says that our medical and health facilities are acting crazy because it's lost its head. Our church is acting crazy, bringing in the drums and the guitars and the false music and messages. Why? Because we've lost our 
I want you to see that our basic problem is that we're no longer connected to the head. It says, our publishing work in kindred institutions, all of our institutions messed up. And the one reason, because we are not connected to the head. What about our homes? Are we having problems in our home? What about the marriages? What about our children? This is happening with youth and adults because we've lost out of our head. We're told that we follow God's principles that God gave to this church. We're told that our churches should be, our homes should be like heaven where? Upon the earth. Never be a divorce if it was heaven on earth. Never a separation, never any bad children. This would be a difference. And God wants to develop this back again. What do you say? That's an Adventist home. Now, what's Babylon's problem? What happened to Babylon? Why did he get so confused? It took another head except, instead of Jesus. What head did Babylon take? What head did the Babylon take? It says here that they, they tell you, this is the Catholic Church. It says, uh, the, uh, Benedict XVI and the two, is the 265th, and he's the current pope, the, by virtue of his office of Bishop of Rome, the sovereign of the Vatican City State, and the what? Head of the Roman Catholic Church. When you have a man as your head, you're going to be confused. And so the real head, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, the real head is who? Jesus. But the head was severed from the churches of Babylon when Christ moved. Now you follow me. What about the Protestant world? Does it know where its head is? Does the Protestant world know that Jesus is in the most holy place? No, it doesn't. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that what we must do is find out where Jesus is and how to connect back to him. We will find that a key lies in the thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Psalms 77 and 13. We'll go further. We know that the school of the prophets came to existence for this very reason, to bring us back so that we can give this message to the world. And it says the institutions were missionary seminaries designed to maintain a what? higher standard of morals and religion at a period when the deplorable condition of degeneracy and corruption call loudly for such reformatory effort. In other words, the more apostasy we see, the more of a need of the schools of the prophets. We found out that the time must be by the passing of a national Sunday law that God gets this body ready. Now, you know what the problem is? Most people think that they're going to be able to wait until the Sunday law pass and then wake up at the Sunday law like the foolish virgins <clears throat> and then just get ready. Can that take place? You know what's going to happen when that Sunday law is passed? Many of us are going to find ourselves like Samson. Remember Samson? He was on the bed of Delilah, put his head in her lap, lost his strength, and didn't know it. The Bible says our strength is in the sanctuary. He lost his strength while he was sleeping. His strength was stolen from him from a harlot. So a harlot stole his strength while he was sleeping, and he woke up from his sleep with no strength and didn't know it. And do you know that when that Sunday law is passed, many of us are going to get up from that sleep, and we're going to think the strength is there, and we're going to say, Lord, I'm going to stand for you, and we're going to find out, just like Samson. Remember what Samson said? He, before, he had given tricks and tricks, do this, do this. Finally, they cut off his locks. And after it was over, Samson. The Philistines be upon you, saying, and said, I will do as I've always done before. I remember coming up, waking up, doing something. I didn't have devotion, but I still was all right that day. I, didn't, I wasn't faithful. I didn't eat right. I didn't think right, but I was still faithful that day. I fussed with this person and that, husband and wife, parents. I, I was all right, and I just went through the day, and everything was all right. Do you know that when that same law is passed, many of us are going to wake up with that same experience and find out we have no strength. Only when it's too late. Now, Samson had another chance to get it right, but seven Adventists won't have a chance after this. Do you see why these schools are so important? Do we need to take this individually? Yes. And say, oh, Lord, help us. Now, my brothers and sisters, we need to know then what happens to get this body prepared for this time. What happens by this time? Question. When that Sunday law is passed, it's too late for that body to get ready. Now, is this Sunday law almost here? This one says from Israel, we look at this. I want you to notice another point right here. Go in your Bible very quickly to Daniel. What book did I say? Yes. Daniel chapter 11. I want you to notice something. Just before the latter rain falls, I want you to notice the condition that exists. And this says in 2011, government to consider adding what? Sunday as a day of rest. So that no one in the world can say that Sunday is not coming. Everywhere in the world you see it. All over the newspapers. Now, my brothers and sisters, tell me what type of person they asked about the changing of this day. Watch now. It says, the prime minister 
appoints the what? Head of what? National Economic. What type of council? Economic council as chairman of committee to look into making Sunday day of rest and Friday half day. So why, before he made this day of rest change, who did they, who did they ask if it would be all right? The economic council. I wonder if there's a relationship between the passing of this Sunday law and the economic condition. In America, 2008, it says Oregon auto dealers want a what? What happened in 2008 to want make states in America want a Sunday's law? It says facing a steep economic downturn that is putting some of them out of business that Oregon uh, auto dealers will go to the legislator asking for a day off. We find out that as the economy goes down, the desire for Sunday laws go what? Now, I wonder if the Bible says that we will see an economic crisis just prior to the outpouring of the latter rain. Watch now. Because that body has to be prepared before the latter rain. Are you following me? We're almost here. Fox News, all over the world. 2012. Let's make Sunday a what? Can the whirling say that Sunday is not coming? Can he say that? Not if he's intelligent. It's all over the newspapers. Fox News says, let's make Sunday a day of rest. And the world sees it, but they don't know what it means. God has given the truth to us to open up to the world. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at this now. The Bible, uh, Vine 9, 14. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the what? The 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its what? Complete fulfillment. So this tells us that we're nearing the end of Daniel 11 chapter. Am I right or wrong? We know we haven't gotten to Daniel 12, 1 because when Daniel 12, 1 happens, Michael stands up. When he stands up, the world body must be prepared to stand. But the, the rib body, the remnant body must be prepared to stand before the world body because who can get the world body to stand if there's no rib remnant? Are you following me? Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. Talking about Daniel 12, 1, when that time of trouble takes place. So does the Bible tell us what's going to happen prior to Jesus standing up and that trouble takes place? Look at Daniel 11, Daniel 11. We don't have time to go deep into this. I just want you to see a point as we go forward. Daniel 11, beginning now in verses 41. The Bible says, talking about the king of the north. The Bible says in 41, he shall, Daniel eleven forty one. he shall enter also into the glorious land. And many countries shall be what? Overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, I'm just going to tell you this. This king of the north represents the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. This king of the north is making a comeback. And as he gets ready, look at verse 12. It says, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the what? You will notice when you study the Bible that when the hand stretches forth, that's a time of persecution. So it says it's getting ready to take place all over, but notice what happens before that. Verses 43 says, but he shall have what? Power over the treasuries of what? Gold and silver. So this tells us that just prior to the time of trouble, the king of the north, the papacy, is going to take the control of the power of the money. Are you following me? So... We must see then if the Sunday law is getting ready to be passed, and if we're right about the king of the north, then the papacy should tell us how to gain control of the power of the money. Am I right or wrong? Has that happened right now? Has the pope already made that statement? Let's look at it. Look at what it says, Daniel 11. Final economic crisis. We're in it in 2013. Look what it says. This is from 2011, October. Vatican calls for what? Central World Bank to be set up. This has to happen just prior to the Sunday law, and we're going to find out just prior to the latter rain. But when the latter rain is poured out, too late. Notice now, this is just before the loud cry. How do we know? Look at verses 44. After he takes control of the power of the money, verse 44 says, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall do what? What are the tidings that come from the east and the north that tremble the king of the papacy? The loud cry of the third angel's message. So that means that the latter rain must be poured out when the economic crisis is taking place so that a people can be prepared to give the loud cry to trouble this king of the north. Does it make sense? 
Now, my brothers and sisters, that means if we see this economic crisis where the, where, where the Pope is reaching out his hand to grab the power of the economy, then it's time for the latter rain. Does that make sense? So now look, look what it says. The Vatican called on money for the establishment of a global political authority and a central world bank to do what? Rule over financial institutions that have been outdated and often ineffective in dealing fairly with the crisis. I want to skip past this. That's not my purpose. Look what this says. It is called for, the, talking about the Vatican, the Pope, it called for the establishment of a natural authority with worldwide scope and jurisdiction, jurisdiction to guide what? Economic policy. And notice the words they use. Such an authority should start with the United Nations as its reference point, but later become independent and be endowed with the what? Now, remember now, the papacy said that it's going to have power over the treasury. Now, my brothers and sisters, is this going to take place? Revelation 13, 16 and 17 says there's going to come a time that no man can do what? Buy or sell, save he that have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So that tells us that, that, that whoever puts the mark of the beast in their force, the Roman Catholic Church and America working with him, that when this happens, that there is going to have to be an economic crisis. Am I right or wrong? Because right now, the papacy cannot fully control our economy. But you shall find out that an economy will be in force in which they will be able to control the buying and selling. And right now, it's reaching out its hand to do this. And the Bible says it's going to be done. And when we see this, what does the Bible say? Go to James 5. Go to James 5. James chapter 5. When we see this, the Bible says that when we see this, to be patient because it's time for the latter rain to be poured out. In James 5, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says in James 5, verse 1, Go to, now you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Verse 2, James 5, your riches are what? Corrupted. Your garments are moth eaten. Verse 3 says, your what? Gold and silver is what? Now remember now, this economic crisis, first in Daniel 11, he's going to take control of the gold and the silver. But in James 5, it says your gold and silver is cankered. And the rest of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasure together for what days? So when we see this economic crisis, it is a crisis for the last days. Then the Bible says in verse 7, when you see this, do what? Be patient. Therefore, brethren, why? Until the coming of the Lord, behold, the husband waited for the precious fruit of the earth and have long patience for it until he received the early and what? So the Bible says when you see this economic crisis where the papacy is getting ready to take control of it, when you see it, be patient because the latter rain is getting ready to be what? And that means that as we see this economic crisis, spiritually, we should be saying, Lord, am I ready to receive the latter rain? Because there's a preparation. Do we see the economic crisis right now? So that means that that Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. Just before the latter rain and loud cry, this economic crisis takes place. So in 2013, we are just months from this, and we have to get ready, and not just us, but we have a, re a remnant to prepare, and then the world. Does it make sense? And this is what the School of the Prophets is for. We heard about the fiscal cliff, have we not? Everybody sighed a, a sigh of relief. They said, wait a minute, they came together, the Republicans and Democrats, they solved the problem. You think they solved the problem? Why that, why that band-aid they put on is getting ready to be blown off in just a few months. And we're going to see something worse than we've ever saw before. And it's going to give way, my brothers and sisters, to this crisis. And this is when we see it. God is saying, please, get ready. Get ready. And so, there's no way out of this. And so we see why at this time that we said we have but a few short months. And many think at that time that they're going to be just like Samson. But it's going to be too late. If we get strength, we must do it when? Now. And we must hang on to it. We know why the school of the prophets. We then found out what was the focus of Christ's ministry, what should be the focus of our ministry. What was the focus? Time to do what? Finish the work. That leads us to the point, what is the work that needs to be finished? Does that make sense? We need to understand it. Now, in the school of the prophets, look at what it says now. There's one more point I want to bring out. Yesterday, I was moving uh, rapidly, and I wanted to give you a few texts concerning what we talked about, and then I want to come to the main heart of what we're studying today before we close. Look at the... Look at the principle here. We talked about the three timelines, the school of the prophets in Samuel's day. Then it was reestablished. Remember that? Now, here's the first one. Go in your Bible to 1 Samuel. What book did I say? 
1 Samuel chapter 19. Let's put some text with these principles that we gave, and then we'll move forward. This says, the schools of the prophets established by Samuel had fallen into decay during the years of what? Israel's apostasy. Elijah reestablished these schools, making provision for young men to gain an education that would lead them to magnify the law. Just before Elijah was taken to heaven, he and Elijah visited these centers of training. That was Prophets and Kings 2.24. So we saw Samuel, then we saw it reestablished by Elijah, and then further Elijah, and then further by Elisha. And before Elijah could finish his work, he had to reestablish the school of the prophets. Go to 1 Samuel 19. Did Samuel have a school of the prophets? Is it in the Bible? Somebody said, oh, it's just the quotations. But remember now, the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy tell us the same thing. 1 Samuel 19, beginning in verse 18. 1 Samuel 19, verse 18. What were the students called in the school of the prophets? What were they called? Sons of the prophet. All right. Verse 19. Let's read 18. What did it say? So David did what? Fled and escaped and came to Samuel, to Ramah, and told. Now remember, Ramah is the home of the? So it was a home school too. Praise God. And told him and all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt at Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in, in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the what? Now, remember, they gathered a company of young men that were pious, intelligent, and this company was nothing more than what? The school. Now, even nature knows this. When the scientist sees a company of fish, you know what he calls it? A school of fish. Come on, brothers and sisters. So when you see this company of the prophets, who is this? This is a school. Now, so the Bible says. And when they saw the coming of the prophets, prophesying, and Samuel doing what? Standing what? I mean, verse 20, standing as a point over them. So Samuel then was the instructor over the students in this company of the school of the prophets. Do we see the school of the prophets then in 1 Samuel? Yes or no? Yes. Is it biblical? Yes. All right. It says, the Spirit of God was upon the messenger of Saul, and they also prophesied. Now, I'm going to tell you the story. You read the whole, all the way down to verse 24. It's a beautiful story. Was the Holy Spirit in that school of the prophets? So much so that the highest apostate in Israel, he said, bring me David and kill him. You see, David was of the common order. He was a shepherd. And God rose up a shepherd to become a leader, to lead his people where they should be. Of the common order. And as God, the, 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 the leader, got upset at, at, at God using a common man. And so my brothers and sisters, he said, kill him. And when he was getting ready to kill him, he sent his soldiers one time, two times. Did he send him a third time? Did, 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 did Saul send him a third time? Yes. And do you know, brothers and sisters, each time they came back, what happened to the servants? They start prophesying. Look at verse, uh, look at verse uh, 21. The Bible says, And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers. And they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messenger again the what? Third time. And they prophesied also. Every time they sent messengers to the school of the prophets to stop the school, and the messengers were becoming and converted. Filled with the Spirit just because they came to the school. Until Saul said, You know what? That's too much. I'm going to go down myself. He said, I know I had the devil. I'm going to go down myself. He's not going to get me. Saul stepped foot in the school of the prophets, but guess what? A class was in session. So he couldn't stop the class, and guess what happened to Saul? The Holy Spirit came upon the apostate, and the Spirit took control, and he took off his kingly robes, and he lay down and started prophesying. Amen. Our school should be so filled with the Holy Spirit that an apostate leader who is blind should come into the school and be converted. Amen. This was the original school, but did it stay that way? No, that school, after years later, it fell. But then God rose up who? Elijah to restore the school of the prophets. Did Elijah do it? Go to 2 second, go to, uh, uh, second Kings chapter 1. We're following this in the Bible. Now, same thing, repeating this, reviewing it, but going through the Bible, showing us the same thing. 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings chapter 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You know the story of what Elijah did. Let's go, in fact, to chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up what? Elijah into heaven by a what? When God did that, he was getting ready to translate Elijah. Am I right or wrong? 
But before God could translate Elijah and take him, Elijah had to finish his. But before Elijah could finish his work, guess what he had to do? He had to restore the what? So guess what? He started making some visits doing a circuit around the country to restore these schools all around the country. It says in verse 2, And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to what? What do you think he was doing at Bethel? Raising up a school of the what? Prophets. It says, And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to what? How do we know they was raising up a school of the prophets? Next verse. And the what? Son. This is why it was not Elijah's flesh sons. These were the sons of the schools of the... So as he went to Bethel, he was reestablishing the school of the prophets. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elijah and said unto him, Knowest now that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And you'll find out he did this in several places. He was making a circuit, restoring the school of the prophets. And Elijah could not be translated until the schools of the prophets were reestablished. Do we see that from the Bible? You can read the finished reading that you'll see it. Now, it says, Prophets and Kings 2.25, The heart of Elijah was cheered as he saw that he, he was, what was being accomplished by what? Means of these what? So Elijah was able to see the benefit of the reforms taking place as a result of establishing the schools of the prophets. Then it says, the work of what? Reformation was not complete, but he could see throughout the kingdom a verification of the word of the Lord. So we see the principle first set up there. Samuel established the schools. A time of apostasy. It went down. Am I right or wrong? And then God sent Elijah to do what? restore it, but it was on the irregular lines, and when he restored it, then Elijah was able to finish his work, be translated, and the re Reformation continued until it was finished. Then we see, later on, the same type taking place again. Later on, they were scattered because of the apostasy of the regular Israel, and they went into Babylonian captivity, right or wrong. You'll find that in Desire of Ages 29 as well. You'll find it in Kings as you go through in Chronicles. Follow it down. They were scattered because of their continual violations of the law of God. As they were scattered, did they have any schools? When they were scattered, did they have any schools? When Daniel was taken out of Babylon, did they say now that they had schools or were their schools uh, attacked and destroyed? Tell me. They were attacked, or scattered, thrown down. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. But when they came out of Babylonian captivity, guess what one of the first things they did? They started establishing what? Schools. You read in Desire of Ages 29. But then it goes on. That in the course of time, these schools became more and more what? Corrupt during a time of apostasy. And so God had to reestablish a school. And guess who God used again to reestablish the Israel to have a school of the prophets? Who did God use? Go to Malachi. Go to Malachi chapter 4. What book did I say? Malachi chapter 4. Who did God use? Talk to me. Talk to me, somebody. Who did God use? John the Baptist. Remember that time? Until John the Baptist, you remember? From the days of Babylon until that time, as they began to get scattered, there were no more schools. Greece had taken over, and all this foolishness was between Malachi and Matthew. And as we look at this, then it wasn't until John came that John reestablished the schools of the prophets for Israel on the irregular lines. In Malachi 4, Beginning in verse 5, what does the Bible say? It says in Malachi 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you who? Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful what? Day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers of the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a... So God says, I'm going to send Elijah. Now, this was not the literal Elijah. Elijah was already sent. How do we know that John... Was this Elijah that Malachi prophesied of? Go to Matthew. What book did I say? Go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. Now I'm reviewing this, so I'm moving quite quickly because we still have to get to a point today. But I want you to write down in your notes. You're familiar with this. You're going to Matthew 17. But write down in your notes Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter what? 1 verses 15 through 17. That's when the angel, angel Gabriel spoke to John's father, whose name was Zacharias. And he said to John, uh, to, to Zacharias, he said, your son John is going to be given the spirit and power of Elias or Elijah. 
He's going to come in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. So it's used the exact words of Malachi 4 and 5. Did Jesus believe this interpretation? Of course. In Matthew 17, look at what it says beginning in verse 10. Are you there, amen? Let's read verse 10. What does it say? And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must what? Now, you remember what just happened? What just happened to Jesus? He was on the Mount of? Did anybody ever visit Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Who visited Jesus? Moses and who else? And Elijah. Literally Elijah. And so all of a sudden when the disciples saw that, the Pharisees had an interpretation. They had a scholarly interpretation of Elijah. They said, you can't use this approach of using this text. No, 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 he can't come in the spirit. No, no, no. They did not understand the spiritual truth that God had given. And so the scholarly approach, I'm telling you the truth. The Pharisees said that literal Elijah was going to come back. Not someone in the spirit of Elijah, but a literal Elijah would come back. So when they saw literal Elijah, they said, maybe Jesus is getting ready to become Messiah because that was the scholarly teaching of Elijah. But then Jesus said, no, there's a common man's interpretation. Amen. In Matthew 17, beginning in verse 11. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, what? Truly shall first come and do what? So when Elijah comes, will he restore the school of the prophets? He's going to restore all things. Then the Bible says in verse 12, But I say unto you that Elias is what? Come already. And they knew him not. But have done unto him whatsoever they listed, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them, of who? John the Baptist. So who is the Elijah that was going to come before the first coming of Christ? John the Baptist. Did he restore the school of the prophets? How do we know that John had a school of the prophets? And because he had his disciples, uh, can anyone tell me, uh, how to say, uh, what, what is it in Spanish? What do you say? Disciple? What is it? Discipulo. What does that mean? A disciple. What is a disciple? Tell me. A student. Then if they're a student, there must be a school. So Luke 11 verse 1 said, teach us as John taught what? So did John have a school of the prophets? Did John's school of the prophets prepare them for the coming of Christ? So then now, brothers and sisters, as we come down to the last day, because the great and dreadful day of the Lord is not only the first coming, it also takes in the what? Because we're told that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, in which the heaven shall burn with fervent heat. Did that happen at the first coming? So we see that it meant a partial fulfillment, but the day of the Lord is not only the first coming, the day of the Lord also takes in the... And so then that means there must be another Elijah at the end of time. Are you with me? Who is the Elijah at the end of time that prepares the way for the second coming of Jesus? They must be Adventists because they prepare the way for his coming. But they can't just be any Adventists because they have to finish the work. So they must be what type of Adventists? Seventh-day Adventist, because the seventh day finishes the work. So the seventh-day Adventist church is the Elijah that's to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus. Does it make sense? What's your name? Praise God. Now, my brothers and sisters, but along these same lines, the devil says, I've got to destroy this church. Because that's the rib that can do it. Revelation 12, 17 says that the dragon went to make war. And if he could stop the seventh heaven his church, then the body will never be prepared to stand. Now, my brothers and sisters, you know how he did this. He sowed seeds in. I don't want to talk about that just now. I've got another place to go. But as we see this taking place of him sowing the seeds, he took control. In 1844, when did God bring Adventists on the scene? What year? 18 what? What year? Uh, are we seven heaven still? Amen? Amen. I was walking down the street, and I got to the end of the corner, just walking, and I saw a place that was called the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah's Witness. As I was walking there, I saw the number of the street, and I said, that wrong church is there. It should be a seven heaven church there. Did, did you notice the number of the, the place? 2,300. When you're walking out today, go look at it. 
You see, the 2300-day prophecy brought Adventists into existence. An Adventist church should be right there on the 2300 block. Represented then into 2,300 days, then shall a what? Sanctuary be cleansed. This brought seven day Adventists to existence. 1844, did they start establishing schools? Yes or no? Yes. Just like all the other examples. But guess what happened? During a time of apostasy, guess what happened to the schools? They become corrupted. Am I right or wrong? Are they corrupted today? Tell them somebody. Is it still God's church? Yes. Does he want us to start some more churches that, that are different, independent churches? No. What does he want us to establish? Schools of the? That's the plan. And as we establish the schools of the prophets, it brings about revival and reformation in the church so that the church can finish the work. Do you see it? Now, my brothers and sisters, then our question should be, what was the focal point of those schools? We read that, volume 6, the church, just talking about the church bringing them in. So our objective is, what is the what? Work that needs to be finished. Are you with me? How would this work be finished? What is our basic problem? You know what our basic problem is? Proverbs 29, verse 18. Without a vision, the people perish. Write the vision, make it play. What did the vision say? The vision said, unto 2,000. And 300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. That's the vision that needs to be plain in order for the seven of church not to perish. It's called the vision, the, the vision of the evening and the morning. It's called the vision, my brothers and sisters. Let's go back. Now, what was the main point of the school of the prophets? We looked at this. What was the main point? What was the object? Let's read this now. Watch this now. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 97. Let's read this carefully and slowly. This brings us to the heart of our study right now. What did it say? The chief subjects of study were the what? Law of God. You, you read your hand out about the school of the prophets. Amen? Did they study this? This is what those schools were like. It said they studied the law of God with the instructions given to what? Now, what were the instructions given to Moses? What were they called? The book of the? Now, before we close, we've got to talk about that book of the law. Because we have a book of the law. And do you know what? The book of the law was on the side of the ark of the covenant. The law was on the? inside and the book of the law was on the outside but it was still the ark and the ark was in the most holy place so whenever the time comes for the most holy place to open up we must not only have the law but we must also have that book of the law so whenever the sanctuary opens up the book of the law will be given back to the Advent people I wonder what this is now my brothers and sisters you know what it is don't you it says sacred history have we been studying history in here and prophecy it says sacred music. We need to know the difference between worldly music and what? Have we heard something about sacred music here? Have you listened to some sacred music here? Praise God. It says, and poetry. It was, but listen now, all those were studied, but it had one great objective. Watch now. The great grand, the grand object of how much? All study. To learn the what? Will of God and the duties of his people. Listen to me now. That although they studied many things, the purpose of all their study was just really one thing, to understand the will of God and the duties of his people. I want you to say that with me, please. To understand the will of God and the duties of his people. We're going to find out that there's some things we're going to do because if we don't do it, we will never come to the place where we shall never fall. If you, what, what is a duty? What is a duty? A job or something to be done, right? A duty is something to be done. So that means that if you do these things, you shall never fall. There are duties we need to learn if we're not going to fall. What is one of those duties that was been made plain? Prayer. What is another duty that's been made plain? Health reform. Are these duties? We're going to find out that on the Day of Atonement, there was something called duties of the congregation. And the work can never be finished until we understand those duties. What, remember, the, the common people have to learn what needs to be done. So this says that the great objective of the school of the prophets was to understand the will of God and the duties of the people. The, in the records of sacred history were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. From the events of the past were drawn lessons of instruction for the future. They studied prophecy. It says the great truths set forth by the what? 
Did they study the sanctuary? Did they study the Passover? Did they study unleavened bread? It said they studied the types and shadows of, of the Mosaic law were brought to view and faith grasped the central object of all that system. What was the great object of all that system? Look now. The Lamb of God. Who is that? Jesus. Praise God. The center of this. But what is it that Jesus is to do? The Lamb of God that does what? So the work can never be finished until sin is what? Jesus cannot leave this earth until sin was taken away. Am I right or wrong? When he died on the cross and said, it is finished, what was he talking about? Behold, the Lamb of God, which what? Taketh away the sin of the world. He was able to say it's finished because now the Lamb made it possible to take sin from earth to heaven. But the work is always finished by taking sin away. We'll more about that later. So the purpose was to learn the will of God and the duties of his question. Is that what we need to learn in the school of the prophets? That's the purpose of all of this. So we have something to do when we leave here, brothers and sisters. God has a part and man has a part. Now, my brothers and sisters, what or where do you think we're going to learn this duty? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Look at this now. Psalm 77, 13. Look what it says. It says in Great Controversy 430, the condition of the, I'm going to go down. All Israel were required to gather about the what? Sanctuary. And in the most solemn manner, humble their souls before God, that they might receive the pardon of their sins and not be cut off from the congregation. Just write down Great Controversy 430. Write down duties. And look at this now. It says, how much more essential in this anti-typical day of atonement that we do what? That we understand the work of our great high priest. That's Jesus' part. But do we have a part? Understand his work and then what? Know what duties are required of us. In the school of the prophets, they understood those duties. Does it make sense? So where are we going to find these duties? Great Controversy 423. What does it say? The subject of the sanctuary was the, the subject. Let's say this all together. Please, let's say this together. The subject of the sanctuary was the if you don't get anything else, please get this, brothers and sisters. The subject of the sanctuary was the key. The key. Which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, but complete, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing, listen to me, let's read it together, and revealing present duty. This is present truth. That's why in 2 Peter, after it said that when we do these things, these duty, then he said you can be established in the what? Present truth. It says that the God's hand directed the great Advent movement, revealing present duty. How? As it brought to light the position and work of his people. When we learn the work of this people, we can finish the work. What do you say? Amen. Where must we go to understand the work? Thy way, O God, is in the, it is the key. Now, if you were the devil, what would you do? I would take that key and make it lost. In fact, in the Jewish nation, the Bible says that some lawyers came along and took away the key of knowledge before Jesus got there. We're going to show you that the key of knowledge has been taken from us. And the sanctuary, brothers and sisters, is the what? Look at that. Now, in order to, when you have a key, what does the key do? It unlocks something. Now, so that means if we don't have the key, we can't unlock it. Are you following me? Watch. The sanctuary, the subject of the sanctuary is the key that unlocks the position and work of God's people. We can then begin to understand its duty. So that means we have to study and find out something about this key. Now, which one this says? Volume 9, page 19. It says, in a special sense, seven day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the what? Last warning for a perishing world. They're going to finish the work. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given what? A work. a work. And what type of work is this? This is the finishing work, the last work. It says on them. It says they have been given a work at the most solemn point. Now we learn what the work is. We've been talking about it over and over again, but we've got to unlock it. They've been given the work. What is the work? They've been given a work at the most solemn import, the proclamation of the what? First. And second and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great what? Importance. There are to allow how much? 
Now, if we believe that, we would ever remove the three angels from our logo, would we? And so we now know that this is our work, the threefold message. But do you know what? Most people can even hear that and still not know what's inside of the three angels' messages. Look what this says. Our lesson for the present time. How can we most clearly comprehend this? I'll come back to this another time. Although we haven't trust the grandest and most important truths ever presented to the world, we are only what? Do you feel like a baby when you study sometimes? As far as our understanding truth and all its bearings is concerned, who's the teacher? Brother Davis? Christ is the teacher. It's the revelation of who? Jesus Christ, Revelation 1, verse 1 through 3. It says, in that which he revealed to John, we are to do what? Tax our minds. What does that mean? We have to let these minds be worked hard. That means we have to keep the mind clear to be able to do this. Does that make sense? This is why health reform is so important. It says, and that which he revealed to John Whitter takes our minds to understand and clearly define, we are facing the most important issues that men have ever been called upon to meet. When this St. Lawrence passed, brothers and sisters, and it leads to this great crisis, it is going to be the greatest crisis the world has ever seen, and no one knows anything about it except for the remnant. Now listen to this now. The theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the what? First and second. So of the three, what is the most important? The third. But you have to have all three together. Are you following me? <clears throat> they embrace each other. It says, all, not some, but all should understand the truths where? Wait a minute. So the three angels are a container. And the contents are not on the outside. The contents are on the? Please understand this. We're getting ready to close. It says, all shall understand the truths contained where? In these messages and demonstrate them in daily life for this is essential to salvation. So we get to get the contents and then we need to practice the duties that are in those contents. We're to demonstrate them in daily life. Is it salvific? It is essential to salvation. We should have to study earnestly, prayerfully in order to understand these great truths. Now, my brothers and sisters, listen. If the three angels are a container and the truth is contained inside, tell me, you have a bottle of water right there. The bottle of water is only a what? Container. Do you drink the container? No. You drink the contents. So is the container important? Yes. Because if you didn't have a container, it couldn't hold the contents. So the container is necessary, but you don't have enough just because you say, well, I have the three angels' messages. You must know what is inside of them. And the only way to know what's inside of them, you have to take the cap off. What do you keep the cap on? You try to drink it. Even though the contents are in, does it come into your body? You know what? Many inside of the body are not getting the contents of the three angels' messages. The cap is on. Somebody must take it off. And the school of the prophets must take off that cap so the contents can come outside into the body. Now, my brothers and sisters, what do you need in order to get that cap open? Not some strain. You need a key. If you have a door, if you have a door, brothers and sisters, and it's locked, what do you need to get inside the house? You need a key. Have you ever thought you had a key and you found out that you locked your keys and you didn't have it? So the key is the subject of the... So you cannot get the contents inside of the three angels' messages to finish the work unless you get the, con the key of the subject of the... So before the work could be finished, God had to reestablish and open up to the, to, the, to the churches what the sanctuary was. Thy way, O God, is where? Does it make sense? So now, my brothers and sisters, and then we can demonstrate them in daily life. I want to talk about this here, but I can't because I want to finish with this point. Do you know what the key is? Do you know what the key is? It's the subject of the sanctuary. I'm going to come back to that because I don't have time to really deal with this now. I'll do that next period. The subject of the sanctuary is the key. Brother Mason showed this, the present truth, the foundation of our faith. Brothers and sisters, the scripture, which above all others, have been both the foundation and the central pillar of the what faith? Say that with me. The what? Advent faith was the declaration, what was it? Unto 2,000 and what else? Now you know why. That Jehovah's Witness building should be a Seventh-day Adventist church. Are you following me? Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? 
These have been familiar words to all believers in the Lord's soon coming. By the lips of thousands was this prophecy repeated as the watchword of their what? Can you imagine? People were getting ready to die, and they were upset and discouraged, and people were laughing and joking those Adventists, but all they needed was one word to buoy their spirits up. Somebody would say, you're in trouble. You don't have your, any more money. Your, your family is dying. And all somebody had to say was, unto 2,000 and 300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, and those Adventists would cheer up. I'll never forget one Adventist preacher. He had been baptizing many, many souls. He would go into the water, come back out. More souls want to be baptized. Go into the water, come back out, more souls want to be baptized. And this Adventist minister in the cold of autumn contracted pneumonia. And just a few days before October 22nd, 1844, that Adventist preacher died because he loved Jesus and wanted to baptize souls. They, the, the people said, you're going to kill yourself. He said, but these are souls that want to be baptized. He loves souls more than he loved himself, brothers and sisters. And then... His families were broken up. He had several children. His wife and children had lost their father, but you know they weren't sad. The children said, Mother, Father is gone. But the mother said to him, Child, don't worry, because until 2,000, and 300 days. Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Don't worry. In just a few short days, Jesus is coming. You know, those children knew what they meant because every child was taught this. They smiled. They said, it's just like a vacation. When Daddy used to travel around the city, he will be gone for several days. But in a few days, he came back, and there was rejoicing in the morning. They said, in October 22nd, just a few more days, Jesus is coming. It was the watchword of their faith. But on October 22nd, 1844, guess what? Jesus didn't come. There was known in history as the great. Can you imagine how that family felt? Disappointment. James White said he, would, he cried more than if he wept and lost his baby. He wept like a baby. Now notice this now. This is the Advent faith. What was the foundation of the Advent faith? Talk to me. What was the foundation? Daniel 8, 14. What is the foundation of the seven Adventist faith? Who says the same? Who says the same? What is the foundation of the seven Adventist faith? There's a little difference now. Daniel 8.14 was the foundation of the Advent faith, but there's something that had to be added to Daniel 8.14 to make it the foundation of the seven Adventist faith. You know what they thought? They read Daniel 8.14, but they thought that the world was the what? Sanctuary. Was that true? There was no text in the Bible. As they studied the Bible, they found out that the sanctuary was not on earth, but the sanctuary was where? They, found, they read Hebrews 8 and 9 and found this out. What is the foundation of our faith? Evangelism 2.21. It says, foundation of our faith, not, not Daniel 14 alone, but the what? Correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. Not just Daniel 14, but the correct understanding of Daniel 14 is the foundation of the seven evidence faith. One caused a disappointment, the other caused the birth of a church that was going to finish the work. What do you say? Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, they found out that Jesus was not moving. There was a man here. I'm getting ready to close now. I think I have two minutes. Uh, there was a man. That was walking through the cornfield, October 22nd, 1844, disappointed. He was getting ready to hide. Didn't want to see all the multitudes that were laughing at Adventists. This is history of all denominations. And then as that man started walking through the field, three men were there, F. behind, Crozier, and another man by the name of Hiram Edson. They walk through a cornfield. And as he was walking through the cornfield, all of a sudden, he said, in his own words, he felt as if a man tapped him on his shoulder. And he stopped. The other two men kept walking. Hiram Edson was standing back there. He stopped and turned back around, and he said, God allowed him to see in heaven a vision of a high priest that they had been studying about in the Bible, moving from the holy place to the most holy place. And then Hiram Edson said, that's it. Jesus was not supposed to come to this earth. He was moving to the last phase of the plan of redemption so the work could be finished. That's it, brethren. That's it. And all of a sudden, the men looked back and said, what's he jumping up and down about? He caught up with him. Those three got together. They started publishing this thing. This was the beginning of the seventh day Adventist church that was brought into existence to finish the work. Because remember now, the subject of the sanctuary is the, the subject of the sanctuary is the key. 
I want to close with this. Listen. Are we in the great controversy? Is the war coming to a close? It started in heaven, but the Bible says that the devil went to make war with the remnant. That's the war of the last days. Now, in World War II, I'll come back to this. I only hope it's in the sanctuary. We'll come back here. We'll come back here. But I only hope it's in the sanctuary. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, the passing of the time in 1844 was followed by a period of great trial for those who still held the Advent faith. Their only relief, so far as ascertaining their true position was concerned, was the light which directed their minds where? To the sanctuary above. It says, they waited and watched and prayed to know the will of God. They saw that their great high priest had entered upon another work of ministration and following him by faith, they were led to see also the what? Closing work of the church, finishing the work. Then they were prepared to receive and give to the world the solemn warning of the third angel, Revelation 14. Look at this now. Look at this. I'll come back to this. I want to get to this point. Anybody know that man is right there? Listen, in World War II, you remember World War II? Hitler was taking control. And as Hitler was taking control, Hitler was taking down nation after nation. Am I right or wrong? The war was going strong. America, were they the first people to get in the war? They were isolationists. They didn't want to get in the war. But at the very end, America knew that they get in the war, they were in trouble. They said, Hitler's getting ready to take this war. We better get in and do something. So America gets into the war. And as America got into the war, Brothers and sisters, they found out that Hitler had made a storm. Now listen, Hitler had found out in his, with his scientists how to use what was called the atomic bomb. He had some scientists just before it was developed. This man, Einstein, had developed something called E equals MC squared in 1905. It took about 40 years, just a little under 40 years, to begin to fully develop this into something that could be practiced and demonstrated. When Einstein first developed it, he said it was impractical to be able to use it. It had power, but nobody could practically use it. They didn't know how to split atoms with less power. So he just studied it and found out that was a theory. But then that theory in 1945 was turned into what? A reality. When an atomic bomb came down on Nagasaki in Hiroshima, and as a result of this, what took place to the war? World War II did what? It came to an end. Because the theory of how to create this atomic bomb fell into the hands of the right person. Now, do you know the story of that? Brother and sister, you're going to find out that it says here, Einstein's first letter to Roosevelt, the letter that launched the arms race, a warning to President Roosevelt of the possibility of constructing extremely powerful bombs of a new type with hints that the German government might be doing just that was addressed and dated uh, a Peconic, Long Island, August the 2nd, 1939. It was most likely written by Leo Sillard. He was a Jewish scientist who had found out how to split the atom. He had known and found out that uranium did it. The scientist who invented the chain reaction. Nevertheless, Einstein took full responsibility for the consequences, called it the greatest mistake of his life. He tried to reproduce the format. Uh, anyway, he talks about the letter. I have the actual letter they wrote, but what happened was this scientist came to Einstein and he said, Listen, that Jew, he was a Jew, he knew that, I, that if Hitler won the war, it was in, they were in trouble, all the Jews. So he came over to Einstein. Einstein had fled to America. He came to Einstein. He said, Einstein, listen. He said, Look, Hitler is getting ready to use an atomic bomb that already took control of Czechoslovakia, who had all the uranium, and America didn't have so much uranium. And so as a result, they stopped selling it, and they said, Hitler is getting ready to do this. This man said to Einstein, listen, they have found out how to use it. Einstein said, no, 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 I studied this theory for years. It's impractical. The man said, he showed him a paper and showed him how the chain reaction works. And Einstein was so brilliant, he read the letter, and he said, it can work. He said, what do you want me to do? Because if he wins the war, we are dead. They wrote a letter to President Roosevelt, and they set in motion something called the Manhattan, Manhattan Project. We have another project that God's going to set in motion called the Relief Project. But he had the Manhattan, Manhattan Project. And when he put the Manhattan Project into effect, they sent scientists from all over to gather these theories to get the chain reaction first so that they would have the first atomic bomb. And whoever got the atomic bomb first won the... Let me tell you, the chain reaction is in the subject of the... I'm closing right here. Let's see this. I'm closing right here. 
Look, let's read this together and we'll close. Volume 5, 575. It says, the great plan of what? Heavenly Father, let's get ready to close. Please help us to see this as we're closing. Help us to see this as the chain reaction that will finish the work so that we may know Jesus and the atonement can be finished. Thank you, Jesus, and in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read it all together. Please, let's read it all together. Volume 5, 575, one of the most important quotations in all the spirit of prophecy. It says, the great what? Plan of redemption as revealed in the what? Not just the beginning of the plan of redemption, but the end of the plan of redemption. And the closing work of the last days shall receive close examination. The scenes connected with the sanctuary above should make such an impression upon the minds and hearts of all that they may be able to do what? So we should understand the sanctuary enough so we can impress others with it. It says, all need be to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the... You see, most people think that the atonement ended at the cross. No other church knows this but the remnant church. The plan of redemption is not yet finished. It says, when, oh, no, 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 all need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of atonement, which is going on when? So you mean to tell me there's an atonement that takes place in the sanctuary? What do we know it to be as we study the Bible? The day of? Watch now. It says, what is going on in the sanctuary above? When this grand truth, talking about the day of atonement, when we see the truth contained in it, when this grand truth is first what? Seen, we saw it in 1844. The world's going to see it later on. But when it's seen and what? Understood. Those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to do what? Stand in the great day of God and their efforts, it won't fail. This is the chain reaction. If we get it, we win the war. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, Truly, dear God, thy way is in the sanctuary. Jesus is that way. And Father, teach us this plan of redemption. Because he who understands this has the key to finish this work so that Jesus may come. This is the purpose of the school of the prophets. Because though the priest had a work, your people had also a work. And the work can never be finished until the duties are done by both God and man. Help us, Lord, to work with you. Give us this love for Jesus, Lord. Put everything out so that we can have Jesus to come in. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.